It's 4 o'clock on a Monday. You know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yahoo! All the way from Los Angeles, California. How are you guys? Welcome to the big show. Today we are going to do an episode of Ask Michael Anything. Um, I did have it planned for us to do an episode of... Um, talking about the the legal aspects of AI because it's such a big topic right now and everybody's obligated to do at least a few AI-related shows. Um, unfortunately, the, the music attorneys that I wanted to get on the show couldn't make it today, so I've uh, got to reschedule that for the weeks to come. Oops, got to bring my levels down. Uh, let's make sure that I am actually airing. There I am. All right. All is good. Um, so we will get to that. Uh, but today, as I said, we're going to do Ask Michael Anything. And I've got to say, you guys said in some tough questions today. Usually they're like stuff I can answer in my sleep, but there were a couple today that I might not be able to answer in my sleep, if at all. But we will find the answer for you. Um, Andre, I was thinking about you an hour ago. I was watching uh, somebody fly fishing in a river in the Middle East for the smallest trout I've ever seen in my life. It's like they can't legitimately call them fish. They should call them bait. Um, anyway, all right, let's jump right into these questions. Ask Michael anything questions that can range. And I will get to stuff in the chat room. These are the ones that came in... Um, to Liz via the interwebs. So the first one right out of the box is for us newbies. Uh, could you go through the process slash taxi forms to submit a listing? If you could, please start with the artist profile form, then on to whatever is next. George, that would take me about a third of the show to go through, but we did talk, uh, Liz and I spoke before. So what you should do, um, actually, I don't know if you're in the U.S. or abroad, but email liz at taxi.com, and she will set you up with a member services person. Um, maybe you guys can do a Zoom or a phone call, and they will walk you through every one of those steps. We do have various um, video tutorials, uh, but I think they're kind of compartmentalized, so you'll be better off getting the whole thing. So there you go. I hope you're watching the show and I hope you got that information. Um, the next batch, and I say batch because there are several in there, I may skip around um, for people that submitted multiple questions. Uh, this is from Super Blonde, and Super Blonde always has a lot of questions. So uh, let me take one of these and then I'll go to somebody else's. Oh, yes, Marion Laird saying 61 watching and only 19 likes. Give us a like. You know what? If you're not a subscriber to the channel already, please hit that red subscribe button. Uh, if you haven't given us a like, please do. Uh, we really, really, really are incredibly insecure, and we like it when YouTube gives us a little love. So give us some love. Um, okay, Super Blonde's first question. Super Blonde, are you present and accounted for? Um, First question is, in a solo piano instrumental cue, uh, should the VST uh, have humanized noises like key noise and sustained pedal noise turned off, or shall I leave it on? You know, it depends, honestly, on the type of piece you're playing um, and how loud those things are. Uh, there are times I've heard stuff. This is me coming from an engineering and production standpoint and some, you know, I guess an A&R standpoint as well. There are times that I've heard some incredibly impressive sounding piano samples. Um, but they still just didn't sound right to me. Uh, maybe they lacked a little bit of air in the room. Maybe they were mic too close. Maybe they were mic too far. Um, but I'll bet you, if I went back, not that I really can uh, go back in time and, and listen to those again, I'll bet you that some of them didn't have the noises that are part and parcel to a, a human being playing a piano. Uh, you know, like on something really 
quiet and somber. Um, if the noises are at a point of being distracting, not good. If the piano sounds unnatural without them in there, also not good. So it really is a contextual judgment and it's very analogous actually to finger squeaks on an acoustic guitar. Um, Andre Stepanian, who is a world-class uh, guitarist, nylon string guitarist, classical, um, jazz, and, and many others as well. But if Andre were to sit down and play something uh, and took every, you know, went in, edited every finger squeak out, it would probably sound like a sampled guitar. So me personally, this is just me talking as a guy who has spent tens of thousands of hours behind recording consoles, I would leave them in unless they're at the point where they become a distraction. If anybody were to go, is that a pedal noise? Um, then they're probably a little too loud. I honestly don't know if you can control the level of those things. If you can, maybe try them faintly. If you can't, then you've got to make a judgment call as to keeping them in or not. So there you go. Super Blonde, there is the answer to your first question. Um, And I will get to the other ones as I bounce around, okay? Um, and Super Blonde, if you're in the chat room, remind me. I don't want to forget these lately. Um, okay, oh, here's a question from none other than Andre Stepanian, the world's most accomplished guitarist. Uh, oh, this is a good one. I can always count on Andre. Uh, with this Atmos mixing becoming more popular, how will it affect the sync music business if it becomes the industry standard for movies, TV, for those uh, movies and TV, for those who don't have this set up in their home studios? Already Netflix, Spotify, and Apple Music uh, are shifting towards Atmos mixes. Well, I'm once again going to use my favorite word in the whole world. <laughs> world. I can't even pronounce world. Um, context. Uh, I was very privileged to be invited to hear years ago um, when Atmos was very new on the scene. It may have been around for a while, but when it started becoming a public thing, I got invited to go hear Sgt. Pepper mixed in Atmos by Giles Martin, George Martin's son, and somebody else, and they played it for us in a blacked out movie theater, probably a 200-seater. Um, the only light in the room uh, was either the hands on your watch or the exit signs over the doors in the back of the room, other than that pitch black. And at first I wasn't that blown away. But then like second song, it was like, hmm, sounds pretty good. Third song, wow, sounds really good. By the end of Sgt. Pepper, you could literally, it felt like Paul McCartney is the one thought I remember having, because I only am good for like one thought a day. It felt like having Paul McCartney standing two or three feet in front of me, playing his bass, plugged into the console, an amp, direct box, whatever, but I could also literally like hear the calluses on, I was gonna say on his right hand, in Paul's case, it'd be on his left hand, um, playing the strings. And it added depth, a dimension that I just never heard anywhere else. So all that said, Mixing a movie in Atmos, uh, sound effects, you know, a jet flies by, it's coming in from behind you on the right, flies by in front of you on the left and disappears off into the distance. Um, that's a very valid use for Atmos. Um, for maybe people who are really into audio technology, I, I mean, I should be. I'm a certified audio engineer. <laughs> I got my little card. My no, I'm, I'm joking. I don't have a card. I never took a certification course. Um, all that said is there's certainly a place for it. But, you know, um, I do not think, uh, this gets to the root of your question, I think, Andre. I do not think anytime soon that production music libraries are going to ask composers or artists who have material in those libraries to deliver mixes in Atmos. I think Atmos is going to be used by audio post mixers for the whole thing. 
I don't think anybody is going to say, oh, I love that piece of music, but it's not mixed in Atmos, therefore I can't put it in the film. I could be wrong, but uh, just ask my wife or my kids. I'm wrong a lot, apparently. Um, I, I just don't think it's anything you need to be concerned about. Maybe we'll be having a different conversation in a couple of years, but I think you might be overthinking it. Just say it. Um, I would love to get some people commenting in the comment section um, after the live show is done today and we've got uh, the archive up. Let me know what you guys think. Um, and I will cap off that discussion with one other little moment in my sordid history as an audio engineer. Uh, as many of you know, I started out like a world-class studio sweeping floors when I was 19 years old and worked my way up the ladder. It's Criteria Studios in Miami. I still love it. As a matter of fact, that is Control Room A at Criteria Miami. Looks a little cooler than when I worked there, but my favorite room under the roof there. Anyway, um, I was actually standing in that room and uh, Tom Dowd, who legendary engineer, legendary record producer, one of the, he might have brought the first stereo Ampex tape machine into America from Germany, maybe. Um, or maybe it was a four track, whatever. He was ahead of the curve, respected by everybody who knew him. And he's been dead now for, I don't know, 12, 15 years at least, I think. Still heavily respected. And Tommy walks into the room. I happened to be in there doing whatever, probably emptying a garbage can when I was a kid. And uh, there was a, one of the maintenance engineers who was standing on a ladder in the back of the room. We had the two monitors up front that you can see. And then we also had, two speakers that were mounted in the back corners of the control room towed in, you know, pointing down and in a little bit. And that was when um, engineers were mixing records in quad, which it's surround sound, it's quad, you know, but uh, it never really took off. Every, just because, you know, my favorite saying, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well, just because you could pan, you know, like, the low notes of a piano front and left and the high notes right and rear or the drum kit make it come from literally like you're sitting at the drummer's position have the floor tom on oops floor tom on your right um you know the high tom front and on the left that's not how humans really hear music. So Tommy Dowd walks the control room, he sees the maintenance guy taking down the quad speakers and he goes, good, we've only got two ears. <laughs> well, clearly because of psychoacoustics, we hear stuff from, you know, 360 degrees around our head. But I, I think he's right. You know, we're used, I, I tended, when I was still mixing, I mixed records as if I was facing a stage looking at the band in a very two-dimensional way, even though reflections from the band came from the back of the room. Um, it just feels more natural. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just, you know, what we're used to. I don't know. But Andre, that was a long-winded answer. Never given one of those before in my life. But that is my way of telling you, don't sweat the small stuff. It is not for the foreseeable future, in my humble opinion, going to make one lick of difference if you get something placed in a catalog or if your song or instrumental track would get licensed into a, a TV show or a film. I don't think Atmos matters in that regard. <sighs> Andrew Sheps, who's a highly respected mixer, uh, says, don't go crazy mixing things behind the list listener when mixing in Atmos. Yeah. It's like I, for record. Yeah. If I were doing a, a record for a major label, I wouldn't be shocked if they asked me to mix it in Atmos. Um, and I'm sure that there's a percentage of listeners who are like super listeners, you know, the same people that would go out and buy $20,000 speakers for their home stereo. Do you even call it a stereo anymore? Their home system. Um, Maybe those people would listen to Atmos and sit there and mentally masturbate like, wow, do you hear that cymbals coming from the right rear? I don't know. Not who I am. We'll figure it out. Uh, okay, next one. This is from Larry Rifkin. 
first question from Larry, and he's got more, but I'm going to go again. I'm not going to do like four from one person and then leave anybody uh, out of the picture. Larry Rifkin asks, Michael, you may have done this in the past, but what are you hoping will be the result of the request you put out the other day for a compilation of feel-good songs which will be sent to a number of potential buyers? Um, I think I said it in the email that went out or the listing itself, but I mean, we're pretty experienced at this point. We've been doing compilations for years. Uh, we did them back in the 90s. As a matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to be really unprofessional. I'll jump out of my chair and grab something. I'll be back in 10 seconds. You'll get a kick out of this. We've been doing compilations for so long that we actually did them back in, let's see, what year was this? Doesn't have a date on it. Anyway, I would guess this as mid 90s, 95 ish. There you go. Taxi jams. <laughs> okay. Oh, look at that. The back label, Nutrition Facts, with the song listings on there. So, we used to send them out on CDs. We would print up a few hundred of them and send them out to, actually, I think at one point we sent out like 1,200 of these to pretty much everybody in the industry who mattered. Um, and now, of course, we do them in digital format and we send out the playlists on, uh, on disco and we send it to our most active current clients. Um, maybe we include some people who haven't run a listing in six months or a year or two or three, but for the most part, it's the, the people we're working with right now in a big way. And we send it out there uh, largely to incentivize them to go, wow, that music is really good. I need to run more listings with Taxi, which obviously benefits you. Uh, the thing that we kind of thought would happen and we were surprised how in what a big way that it did happen is that virtually everything on those compilation playlists gets picked up and signed by a library very quickly. Uh, we did a, a Zoom meeting with a bunch of our American library clients a few months ago. Um, then we did a follow-up meeting with a bunch of our European and other foreign clients that we've got because their timeline didn't meet up with, you know, when we were meeting with the American libraries, they were sleeping in Europe. So we met with these guys and the European libraries were uh, a little upset about the compilations and why they were upset is because while they were sleeping, their American counterparts slash competitors slash colleagues would jump on signing the stuff that was on that playlist. And by the time the folks in Europe woke up, every single thing had been plucked from the basket already. Um, and I said to them, well, gee, if somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, I signed that eight hours ago with, you know, Tom, whatever his name is in Los Angeles, why don't you guys in Europe say, oh, that's a bummer. Um, can you make more of those? And they went, oh, that's a good idea. So there you go. A little coaching from taxi boss to the industry seemed to work pretty well. And now everybody's happy. And we've actually readjusted the send time on our compilations to try and make it so that the people in Europe are like finishing up their workday when the people in California might be having a sip of coffee first thing in the morning and checking their emails. So hopefully that works out better. But the end result is that I, I've never heard of something not getting signed on the last several or many compilations we've sent out. So you guys get a great benefit. We're really picky about what goes on these things because I, you know, we might get a lot of submissions, but we're looking for 10 to 15 things that are gonna blow our clients away where they go, holy crap, man, I need to reach out to Taxi more often. And they're right, they do. Um, but the side benefit, as I said, is virtually every single one of the composers or artists on those uh, compilations gets a deal offer, if not many deal offers. And a lot of times the, the American uh, libraries will call somebody and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, it just got picked up a half an hour ago by XYZ library. and the guy who is a day late and dollar short will say, can you make more of that? Yes, I can. 
when how many would you like and when would you need them so there you go that that's the oh pete steege says i had two on a compilation and both got signed there you go um Will Derryberry says the compilation Taxi sent out a couple of years ago for Stomp Clap instrumentals helped me get in contact with several libraries as I had a couple of songs on it and I signed several songs as a result of it. So there you go. Um, testimonials from, from your fellow members. Uh, okay, that one's done. Moving on to a question from Bruce Miller. Did I say that when I'm done with the stuff on the paper uh, that was emailed in, I will take some questions from the chat room as well. Um, Bruce Miller wants to know if a listing asks for male or female vocals, is it a good idea to submit two tracks with the same backing track and lyrics, one with male vocals and one with female vocals, or should the backing tracks and lyrics be somewhat unique? Um, if there, if a listing says they want male or female, it no, you don't need. To, you're not covering more bases by sending a, a version of each. Um, I guess you could have. You know, if somebody reaches out to you and says, first of all, the screener. You know, if it's just one screener on that listing, which happens, um, the screener could go. I don't understand this. We've got one with a male vocal, one with a female vocal. Just send it with one or the other. And then if the library reaches out to you and says, wow, this is great, Bruce, I'd be interested in signing it. You could say, I've got a female vocal version. Would you like that too? And they're liable to say, yes. Um, I guess you would treat that kind of as an alt mix. But no, it doesn't increase your chances, I don't believe. Uh, in my subjective opinion, I do not believe that it will increase your chance by even 1% of getting somebody to sign a piece of music because you've submitted one with the male vocal and one with the female vocal. So I hope that answers your question appropriately. Um, Nancy Collell, this one's from Nancy Collell, who I, Nancy, are you in the room today? Um, I was actually thinking about Nancy Collell as I was getting ready for work this morning. She popped into my head. I, I knew that I was doing the show today and that I would see a bunch of people in the chat room that I know. And I was thinking, gosh, I, I haven't seen Nancy in the chat room in a while. And this may explain it. Nancy says, hi, Michael. I shared with you at the road rally that I was taking a part-time job to save up for an Apple MacBook Pro loaded with Logic Pro 10 or Pro X. Uh, well, I finally did it. Yay, good for you. Uh, very good for you. It's mine, she says. Uh, I was also given by an amazing friend a Universal Audio Apollo Twin interface. That's a good friend right there. It's all wonderful yet simultaneously daunting. So here are my questions. Should I sign up for recording classes or keep trying to figure out the recording process through tons of YouTube tutorials? I am muddling through. Um, everyone starts somewhere. I have no home recording experience, but need to get to the point of recording in a more expedient way. What do you say? Well, Nancy, um, I have heard from literally a thousand people in recent years that they are just totally in love with all the great tutorials on YouTube. Um, I do know people that teach classes um, that people have paid for and been very, very, very happy with. I would say, oh, Glenn Ruger's making uh, a recommendation. Why Logic Pro Rules is a good resource. Um, I would say stick with the free stuff. I don't know where you're at. You know, I mean, part of recording is do you understand how microphones sound and what makes them work? Do you understand the physics of audio? Not that you need to be like a, a, a math head or a physicist, because I'm neither of those things, trust me. Uh, not a bad engineer <laughs> by my own estimation, but it's, you know, knowing what kind of reverb is appropriate for a certain instrument, like what the decay time should be, um, knowing if you want kind of a, a rich, full, darkish reverb or something short and bright with a little pre-delay on the front. 
those are the nuances that you learn by experimentation, but you will probably get some recommendations from the courses. So I would say, first of all, if you guys could go into the comment section and list your favorite YouTube uh, teachers for Logic Pro. I, I too, um, never had Logic, never had a DAW on my computer, and I've got a MacBook Pro. I'm staring at it right now. And put got, got it with Logic about three years ago, I think. And I've been watching tutorials when I have time, which is practically never by a guy named Charles Klein, C-L-E-Y-N. Um, seems like a nice, clean-cut young man. Um, and, and he explains things nicely. I wish I had more time to spend with him and watch all of his videos, but that's how you learn. And you know what? Here's the thing, Nats, is one day you're going to feel like daunted and the next day you're going to feel like somebody flicked a switch and you went oh i get it all so much better now so stick with it i know people <laughs> it sounds horrible to say i think you're pretty smart nancy uh i know people who <laughs> might be less smart <laughs> is there a nice way to say that uh, you're smarter than the average bear. This will come to you. And I have nothing but a high level of confidence that you're going to nail it. So just keep watching those freebie tutorials. And if you find that they're not working for you, ask around. I'm sure that there are plenty of your fellow members uh, that can refer you to paid courses that won't cost a fortune um, that will be really awesome. Plus, you're in Los Angeles um, I'm sure that you could go, gosh, uh, I have some friends that I've never taken their course, but I'm sure it'd be awesome, but they teach Pro Tools. They don't teach Logic, but I'm sure that there's some local classes. Maybe there's a benefit in like bringing your laptop to the class and having the instructor walk you through stuff. I think you could do it on video. So many people have had successful, really great results doing it on YouTube that I think you will as well. So there you go. All right, uh, maybe that's why I haven't seen Nancy in the chat room. She's been working that part-time job so she could get the MacBook Pro. Anyway, congratulations. I think that's really awesome that you did it in a very, very smart career, career move. Um, this one is from Ewert Williams. Hello, Ewert. Say I submit slash approve a tune to Taxi for a a critique to, okay so he's talking about when we do one of our taxi tvs where we do live critiques um and the video will air in perpetuity yes it will unless youtube says you're out of here taxi and bounces us which so far in 13 years they haven't um if it then gets signed to an exclusive library should i be worried about the legal complications as a result I would say not. There are some libraries, uh, and there have been some advertising TV commercial situations where they want stuff that's never been out there before. Um, they're more concerned that they put something in a big TV commercial and then it ends up being uh, also in a big TV show at the same time. That concerns them. I do not think that you've got anything to worry about having a piece of music air in a taxi TV episode with, you know, 700 to 1,000 to 2,000 viewers, I, I just don't think that they're going to worry about that. And trust me, if I got a call from a library that said, we really love this piece by Ewert, and we desperately want it in our catalog, but we're a little troubled by the fact that it's in an episode of Taxi TV that you did two and a half years ago, Taxi, would you mute it in that episode? I would be more than happy to do whatever they asked as long as it's for my buddy Ewert. So there you go. Not to worry. Um, next question. This one is from Brendan Henderson. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can figure this out. Hello. I have thought of joining Taxi to submit music. However, the common formatting specifics for submissions is confusing to me. If the ad, I think he means if the listing asks for three submissions of different lengths, how do I go about formatting this correctly to not create issues and need back and forth emailing? Um, you might be conflating a couple things. I'm not really sure. Um, first of all, I think virtually every one of those taxi listings that says, 
you know, submit something that's 90 seconds to two minutes, give or take, but also have a 60, a 30, a 15, a 10, and a five ready to go if the library reaches out to you. Yeah, I didn't understand the question all that well either, Andre, but I'm kind of rehashing it now. So basically saying um, that if a listing says that they're going to want, uh, you know, a 60, a 30, a 15, a 10, whatever, cut downs um, of the original, he wants to know how to format that. Um, <clears throat> honestly, virtually every time they ask for it in full, and if they reach out to you and say, I need versions that are, you know, 60, 30, whatever, just go on the taxi forum and ask your fellow members who are much more adept at creating music in the digital domain than I am. But basically, it's editing. Um, and you would be right, uh, it's smart in some cases, maybe many cases, that when you're composing, knowing that you're going to need to cut something down into shorter versions, look at your time signatures, look at your BPM, and do a little math and figure out, okay, you know, at this BPM and this time signature, and I need to make this into a 15, it's going to be very weird sounding. Um, so composing to accommodate for those cut downs um, is a good thing. But it's not that complicated. Uh, we have a lot of members that have figured it out and successfully done it, so I'm sure you could join their ranks very easily, and I hope that information helps you. By the way, um, Brendan, if you're not on the forum, I'm telling you, we preach this till we're blue in the face around here, but we're not doing it because we make one penny more, but watching Taxi TV, becoming part of the forum community. Everybody who is successful and part of the forum, which virtually every one of our successful members is, um, they will all tell you how incredibly helpful that community of very generous people on the forum have been in helping them learn about things like this. So take advantage of what is out there and free, and we have so much evidence that it works and it's helpful, so there you go. Um, thank you, Liz, for posting forums.taxi.com. All right, that one is answered. This one is from Brewster Mosley. If I submitted a song without my bio, I forgot to include it, um, will the song still be considered? Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, no screener is going to say, oh my gosh, you forgot your bio. The music is great, but you forgot the bio. Sorry, we're sending this one back. It'll be forwarded if it's great. Um, somebody on the staff may reach out to you and say, hey, you didn't include a bio. We want to forward this. Could you please send us your bio? And they would include it. So there you go. So I need to go back to Brewster's second question in a moment. Um, this is an interesting question. This one's from Dennis uh, Traini or Traini. I'm not sure. T-R-A-I-N-I. -I, but Dennis asks... Have you had a chance to check out Band in the Box from pgmusic.com uh, and using the audio file versions of the real studio musician recorded tracks they offer for music production? Um, I have not. Um, I was very familiar with Band in the Box back in the 90s when I started Taxi because a lot of our members used it. Um, and it was not at that point in time producing demos that were good enough to pitch to labels. I heard a couple things that were like, wow, not bad. For the most part, not great. And I'm not sure if that was operator error or the software or band in the box, whatever. Um, I don't know. Uh, so I just can't give you an answer because I don't have any experience, but there uh, yeah, there are AI programs out there now that I believe are either free or really inexpensive. I can't remember the name of one, but I saw a demo of one two or three weeks ago where you take a song and run it through this AI and it will bust out <clears throat> all the individual stems or tracks from that song. Um, well, I mean... That's great for you, like doing a vocal version if you're doing covers in a live situation, I guess. But you couldn't, you know, you couldn't take uh, Ariana Grande, Grande, my uh, favorite artist for reference. You couldn't take an Ariana Grande song, run it through AI, um, take the vocal out. Oh, there's also AI that will remove a vocal from a track. Um, 
which might be handy if you've got a song that you want to, like a cocktail jazz piano thing with a vocal, kind of sultry, smoky, sequin gown vocal on it, and you want to take the vocal out, I guess it's your song and, and you playing on it. <clears throat> that would be a good thing to do with AI if it sounds good. People say that it does. Um, anyway, the future is here, and there's going to be all kinds of tools for you to do that kind of stuff. So, like I said, I'm not familiar with the latest, greatest version of Band in the Box. I hope it's awesome, but I think there are many ways to skin a cat. Um, this one is from Anonymous. Wow, somebody's parents had a really sick sense of humor. Name your kid Anonymous. Poor kid grew up with a chip on his shoulder, you know? It's like an inferiority complex. I'm, I'm a day old and I'm already anonymous. <laughs> anyway, if a music library has reached out to sign several instrumentals to their catalog and has sent you a draft agreement and you have written back that you agree to terms but have not received the final paperwork in almost two weeks, is it okay to submit these instrumentals to other taxi opportunities? Um, you could. I think the next best step for you um, would be to send them one more email that just saying, you know, hi, Bob, Susie, whatever the person's name is that you're dealing with at the company. Um, I sent you back, uh, I'm going to go back. Um, I agreed to your terms, but haven't received a contract yet. Um, I've got other opportunities for that material. Should I be pitching it elsewhere or can I expect that you will send me back a final version, a signable version of the contract sometime soon? Look, as I stated somewhere the other day, I think I was a guest on somebody else's show and I said most libraries, many of the libraries are one, two or three person operations, unless it's you know a big one, like massively big. Most are fairly small. Um, and they spend more of their time pitching and put, putting together playlists, things like that. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a lot of time to spend on what I would call housekeeping. So they probably have nothing but the best of intentions and they're like, oh great, he's gonna sign with us, yay. And then they know the, the cat's in the bag, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, maybe they're just being a little slow about getting back because they feel like, all right, this deal's gonna happen. They should be quicker. But in your world, you've only got that one library at the moment to worry about. In their world, they might be onboarding 64 other composers this week uh, and doing five pitches a day every day of the week, um, plus uploading and tagging and categorizing all the music. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in the library. So I don't think they're dissing you at all. Um, and if they don't get back to you in another week or 10 days with an answer like, oh, we're so sorry. Um, yeah, here comes the, the signable contract. If they don't get back to you, then just start pitching it elsewhere. And if they reach out to you a week after somebody else picks it up, just merely say, I'm sorry, I hadn't heard back from you and I'm like a shark, I gotta keep moving. So I pitched elsewhere, got picked up. Would you like me to create you some other tracks in that same category? And I can't tell you with absolute certainty, but I'd say high probability that they will say, sure, let's hear those other tracks. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a bit of a frog in my throat. Ah, nothing like a warm, red, sugarless Red Bull. <clears throat> this one is from Martin Svensson. Hi. Uh, oh, this is a tough one. This is the hardest one I think I've ever gotten on any episode of Ask Michael Anything. <clears throat> so thank you, Martin. Uh, hi, the other day I received a contract to sign for a taxi opportunity that the publisher liked. Thank you for that, he says. You are welcome. Um, Martin, wouldn't be a bad idea to send an email to dealsattaxi.com because the chances of this piece of paper in my hand making it to the person who assembles the deals for the newsletter, not that great. So if you would, please send an email to dealsattaxi.com, just letting them know about um, 
how many pieces you signed and where you signed them. So thank you for that. Anyway, the, Martin goes on to say, the contract talks about the neighboring rights and that I'm responsible to make sure I collect my own share of these. Excuse me. <laughs> that was a Red Bull burp is what that was. But I have a hard time getting my head around what this is. Martin, I could not agree with you more, and I'm going to confuse all of us even more in a second. I even emailed my PRO, and they haven't gotten back to me yet. That's because they don't understand it either. Maybe they have no clue either. There you go. <laughs> We're both right about that. Um, neighboring rights. In, in the most simplistic definition that I've been able to locate anywhere is rights that are along the other rights next to part and parcel of rights that you would normally have, which is, you know, you own 100% of the publishing at the moment of creation. Um, the publisher share and the writer share are both yours at that moment in time. Um, and then, of course, the um, mechanical, any mechanical royalties that be generated from the master recording. Um, back in the days of records, you know, I'm looking around for a something I could demonstrate that with, but when they're stamping out pieces of polyvinyl chloride or whatever records are made from, um, there was a license to stamp that negative impression from a positive stamper, uh, and that was called making uh, you, for every one made, you would get paid a mechanical royalty. And in America, it was the Harry Fox Agency that collected mechanicals. Well, obviously, even though there has been a, kind of a, a resurgence of interest in vinyl and the vinyl sales numbers are going up, it's still not that big of a deal. So there are all these other rights out there, all kinds of other rights. And frankly, I have asked no less than three or four attorneys who seem to be able to answer everything else very clearly. I had a guy named Brenton Hund, H-U-N-D, who is like the second highest level of attorney you can be at Turner Broadcasting or CNN or whatever company owns both of those. Brenton is a taxi member and he's a really smart, really nice guy. And he did a whole thing uh, at the Road Rally 2021, the virtual rally. Um, and he explained it. I still didn't understand it. I have asked friends of mine who know a lot, like uh, Michael Ames is a good friend of mine, best explainer of publishing related stuff that I think I've ever met. I walked out of the room and thought, I must be the dumbest person ever. I don't get it. So um, I asked my friend ChatGPT today if he, she, or it would be kind enough to explain what the hell neighboring rights is. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I've got something in my throat. Um, where did I put that first thing? Okay. <laughs> I asked ChatGPT, can you please give me a simplified explanation of what neighboring rights in the music industry are? And I'm going to read you what, let's see how long, I asked it a few different ways. <clears throat> and I don't agree with some of the stuff it said, but as one of my friends said not too long ago, uh, I think that ChatGPT and AI in general are like serial liars. Um, I have gotten some stuff where it's like, oh, you just made that up based on what you thought, based on other stuff that you read previously for data points or data sets. Um, but I've definitely found ChatGPT is not infallible. Um, it is largely uh, becomes more fallible when you prompt it poorly. Uh, <clears throat> neighboring rights are a set of rights that belong to performance performers and recording companies. You know what? I'm not going to read this one because it included um, recording companies, and I wasn't that interested in the record industry side of it uh, because most of our members seem to be more interested in sync. So then I said, I don't understand. Please expound. And it says, sure, let me explain in a bit more detail. And it's still talking about record company stuff. <laughs> I said, I still don't understand. And ChatGPT said, I apologize if my previous explanations were not clear enough. Um, and then I said, how do neighboring rights work in the context of the music 
for sync part of the business. So there, I improved my prompt. And ChatGPT says, in the context of music synchronization, neighboring rights refer to the rights of performers and record labels to control the use of their sound recordings and audiovisual production, such as films, TV shows, commercials, video games, other multimedia projects. Okay, so yeah, a record company could want to license an Ariana Grande song, right, uh, to a movie, probably a Disney movie, the cute little female singer that's petite but with a big voice like Ariana Grande. Anyway, when a production company wants to use a sound recording in their audiovisual project, they need to obtain permission from both the copyright owner, usually the composer or songwriter, and the neighboring rights holders, the performers and record labels. Uh, the permission is often granted through a synchronization license, which allows the production company to use the sound recording in their project in exchange for a fee paid to the copyright owner and neighboring rights holder. Great. What does that mean, library versus composer? Um, the use of sound recordings, audio, visual projects can generate significant revenue for performers and record labels. This is a case of ChatGPT, just like trying to puke out a bunch of words. <laughs> like, I'm going to give him a really long answer. It'll confuse the crap out of him, and then he won't bother me anymore with this stuff. Um, for example, a popular song used in a hit TV show or movie can lead to increased sales or streams of sound recording, as well as exposure for the performers and the record label. Neighboring rights also play a role in determining the distribution of revenue generated from the use of sound recordings and audiovisual productions. For example, if a TV show uses a sound recording, the revenue generated from the use of the recording may be split between the copyright owner, the performers, and the record label according to their respective shares of the neighboring rights. So again, neighboring rights are rights that are also contained in and next to the more commonly known rights that are publishing and um, you know copyright uh, composition and um, master recording. So those are the normal things we all know about, hopefully, and neighboring rights or these other little weird rights. Um, Overall, neighboring rights are an important consideration for music synchronization in the entertainment industry. It sounds like a high school kid is writing a paper and trying to stuff as many words in there as they can. As they ensure the performers and record labels are compensated fairly for the use of their sound recordings and audio... I mean, that was a lot of nothing right there. Uh, then I asked how do production music libraries deal with neighboring rights, wanting to know... Uh, contractually, do they say, you know, we control all the neighboring rights, we collect all neighboring rights, blah, 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 blah. Basically, I'm not going to read all this stuff. It'll take too much time. This is an episode in and of itself. And like I said, I've had neighboring rights experts, and they give these BS explanations. And if you say to them, okay, so if there's a neighboring right for a person who played guitar on my instrumental track and I didn't bother to get a work for hire, then they could lay claim to a neighboring right because they played guitar on it, but yet they don't own a piece of the composition. They don't own a piece of the master recording. Oh, but hold on. My friend John recorded this in his home studio, uh, and I paid him 100 bucks for the session and didn't sign a work for hire with him. So technically now he owns part of that master recording or maybe all of it. Um, so he's got neighboring rights. Well, who collects the money for him for that? And who collects the money for the guitar player that I was dopey enough not to get a work for hire sign from? So there are all these different things out there. Um, Um, I, haven't, I, I can't concentrate on this and read that at the same time. Sorry. So some of you guys are getting ignored. Um, my wife always said I've got a one-track mind. But I, I just have not been able to find anybody that can say, okay, if you do an instrumental track for a library, these are the neighboring rights, and this is where you need to go to sign up and this is how they will collect the money, and this is how much you would get using this particular example. I can't find it. And I've asked people that write a lot of books, Bobby Borg, uh, somebody please explain this. And Michael Lames, both bright guys. Michael Lames, like I said, is the single best explainer of publishing 
stuff that I've ever met in my entire nearly 50-year career. And even when he explained it, I walked out of the room. I didn't want to look stupid, so I just went, hmm. I nodded knowingly, walked out of the room, went, I am dumb as dirt. <laughs> Apparently, we are all dumb as dirt. None of us seem to really get it. There are a lot of people that will... Um, that know a piece of it because they asked the question once and got a piece of it explained to them. But then when I explain that to a music attorney, they go, well, that's not exactly the case. So then it's a case of the game of telephone where information, you know, it's like when people say, oh yeah, taxi must be a scam because they charge musicians money. And that takes on a life of its own as it's passed down from generation to generation to generation of people passing it around. Same thing is true, I believe, with neighboring rights. And people go, well, a neighboring right is blah. And they got bad information, and now they screw up the transmission of that information. And the third person, and the fourth person, and the fifth person in the game of telephone screw it up to the point where nobody actually knows what the hell neighboring rights are. And frankly, I think that somebody needs to write a book or do a video series on it and find a better way to explain it you know what? I would just love to see from you guys in the chat room if everybody could type in a plus one if you're a little befuddled by the whole neighboring rights thing going. I know it means more money for me, but I don't understand what the hell they're talking about. Give me a plus one. That'll make me feel better about myself. And that's what the whole point of the show is, right? Making Michael feel better. <laughs> Well, there you go. The plus ones are rolling in. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Real gives a plus 10. That was funny. Oh, man. All right. So I'm going to wait. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, I know who I'll get. Donald Passman, who is arguably the most famous of all music attorneys out there. Uh, he wrote the book, um, Everything You Want to Know About the Music Industry, I believe it's probably on its like 11th printing. Um, I should get past him on the show. He, he's done a road rally with me, I believe, and I think he did a very early version easily 10 years ago or more of Taxi TV. I should get past him on the show and go, okay, Don, lay it on me, baby. Explain what neighboring rights are in the context of taxi members making music for production music libraries that then license it to TV and film. What are the associated neighboring rights? What companies do our members need to sign up with? How often do they get paid? What about neighboring rights that may be in a foreign country? Do you sign up with like sound exchange to get paid in America, but you know, like, um, the British version of sound exchanged, you know, is there a, a geographical difference? Are the laws different? Are the company names different? Are their responsibilities different? Are the pay scales different? I've got all those questions and nobody out there can give you the big picture explanation. So thank you all for letting me know that I am not just plain dumb. Thank you. Whew. Um, <laughs> Drive safely, don't worry about posting. Anyway, so there's my little speech on neighboring rights. Um, oh, I did ask, uh, can you tell me about companies that collect neighboring rights for musicians? And I thought maybe I would get a really comprehensive list of companies, but I didn't. Uh, ChatGPT, not loving it today. Um, really good at making up titles for instrumental tracks and songs. Not so good. I mean, it's literally like when you're a high school kid and you remember the night before you've got to turn in like a 500 word term paper. And let's say it's on Benjamin Franklin. Uh, I actually did a term paper on him, I think when I was in junior high. And, and you're writing about Benjamin Franklin, you know, discovering electricity by dangling a key on a kite string. And rather than just saying Benjamin Franklin was a cool old dude with long hair, pot belly, wire rim glasses, uh, that was quite intelligent, uh, very influential in American politics around the time the country was being formed, but also a scientific guy and is very famous for discovering that lightning um, generated electricity by hanging a key on a kite string, which therefore 
attracted a hit from a lightning bolt. There's the whole thing. If I were writing that in a paper, I could have made that into 500 words, and so could my friend ChatGPT. And I think it's kind of useless, but you know, I'll get better at it, and it will get better. So the answer on neighboring rights companies from ChatGPT is SoundExchange is a nonprofit organization that collects and distributes digital performance royalties for sound recordings. But as we all know, if the music is played on a service where it's on demand by you dictate what you want to hear next, that's one way you get paid, and you get paid by that company, which I think might actually be SoundExchange. If the same thing is true of something else that's played randomly, then you get paid in a different way, and I believe a different company collects the money. And that is probably the thing that most musicians do understand because that's been around in a topic of discussion for years. I apparently, uh, yes, <laughs> I see Faraday, uh, Faraday Shields. I know all about those. It's amazing how much useless information I've got in my head. Anyway, uh, Sound Exchange represents over 250 recording artists, uh, 250,000 recording artists and master rights owners in the United States. Um, in the UK, it's Phonographic Performance Limited, which is PPL, collects and distributes neighboring rights royalties. Which neighboring rights? Um, on behalf of performers and record labels, they represent 120,000 performers and 5,000 record labels. In Germany, it's GVL. I can't even begin to pronounce what the full name is. 140,000 rights holders, including record labels. SENA, S-E-N-A, is the Dutch collective. And by the way, what the hell is a collective? That's another thing. You can ask a collective of a thousand people what a collective is and you will get 999 different answers. Um, Australia has the APRA AMCOS Australian Collective Management Organization that collects and distributes royalties for performance and communication of musical works as well as neighboring rights for sound recordings. They represent a hundred thousand members in Australia and New Zealand. Um, then I said, can you tell me the types of rights each of those collect for musicians, right? Pretty intelligent question. And it went down and basically it just repeated the same old crap. So there you go. Uh, I'm not going to waste your time with that. So we learned absolutely nothing except that I'm dumb as dirt, and apparently you guys are in the same club right there with me. But it makes me feel better because honestly, I, I wonder, is like my brain smaller than the average person? Did I smoke too much pot in college? Um, was my mother telling me the truth when she said she dropped me on my head, taking me out of the crib one time? I don't know why I can't understand neighboring rights, but somebody please, we are begging you, somebody please explain that shiz to us in a way that we can all understand. All right, let's go back to the questions now. And I'm going to go back and take some of the second ones that were emailed from before the show. And once again, anonymous, tell your parents I think that was a cruel joke. Um, all right, I've taken care of all the first round questions. Here we go. Second question from Super Blonde. Uh, with instrumental cues created by VSTI, such as minimal piano and strings, with a specific mood, do the library slash production companies prefer a constant tempo through the entire cue uh, or ease of editing on a grid? Um, I don't know. I know what ease of editing is. I know a grid. I'm not sure if you're talking about editing on uh, whatever. Or do they prefer a tempo map? Uh, for expressiveness, i.e. rubato might be a slight change or maybe a larger tempo arc depending on the mood. Sounds more human yet would not instantly align on a grid. I think he's talking about a MIDI grid. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, any, anyway, in any case, the bottom line is if you do stuff that it's like... If you're moving around your tempo, uh, you're, you're creating something that's going to sound like score and not like an instrumental cue. Therefore, it makes it much more unusable um, 
keep the tempo throughout. Um, that's all I can tell you. That's the simplified version, the simplified answer to that somewhat hard to understand question. Um, with all this grid stuff. Uh, all right. Um, there's another one from him I'll go back to. Larry Rifkin asks, asked a second question. Oh, this is an interesting one. In these fraught political times, uh, some of the best songs I've been writing are political or social commentary. Um, is there a market for these songs? Not like, oh, he even met, after all, uh, music drove the 60s and these times, hello, what did I do wrong? You said you were done with the first time question. Oh, wait, a bunch more. more pages. Thank you. Yep. Um, that was Liz stopping in for a visit. Um, anyway, I've been running a, yeah, after all, music drove the 60s and these times demand the same. I haven't seen any such requests. I called this into the member desk. I think he means member services at Taxi the other day, and the woman said she would pass it on to the team. If not, is it worth putting such material on an EP digitally? If so, what do you recommend? I've held off doing this so as not to jeopardize a placement through taxi. All right, honestly, Larry, I think I've seen one or two listings that might have asked for political or protest stuff, but I can't remember, honestly, if they were like, can you say, I think they might have been looking for era appropriate stuff, you know, that sound, music that was actually recorded, vintage stuff recorded back in the 60s when, you know, people like Bob Dylan or Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Joan Baez were, were doing protesty songs. Um, I honestly, I don't think there's much of a market for that today. I really don't. Um, frankly, back then, uh, the music was more central to the lives of the average person because we didn't have these nasty little buggers in our hands all the time. So, you know, we'd listen to music in the car, we'd listen to music at home, sit down, smoke a doobie, not that I ever did, but some people did that I heard, and uh, or have a glass of wine, whatever, you know, sit down, just listen to music and groove out on those brand new stereo speakers that were not playing Atmos mixes. And, and just enjoy the music. And yes, because the Vietnam War was such a big thing, and trust me, I was a big anti-Vietnam uh, War person. Big, big as they come. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that there is as big a market or maybe not even any significant market for that kind of music right now. Just a guess. But you know what? Sure. Go ahead. Do an EP, but don't press it up uh, on disc necessarily unless you have a marketing plan and know who you're going to market it to, which, you know, it's one thing. If you were doing stuff that was vintage-like or, or, you know, about the Vietnam War, it'd be to a lot of baby boomers, my age group. Nowadays, I don't know, do you sell it to Antifa? Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know who you would market it to. I really don't. Um, I, I, I don't have a good answer other than to tell you that I just don't think the market is there, but you could put it out. Make the songs, put them on Spotify. Maybe I'm wrong. Like I said the other day, I, I've been wrong once or twice before in my life. Wouldn't be surprising. Find out that I'm wrong about something now. So put it on Spotify. See if it gets any traction. But you could put a mega hit on Spotify and it might not, probably wouldn't get any traction because just the sheer quantity of stuff that's up there. Um, <laughs> Timothy Rue, great suggestion. Market it to the French. There you go. Um, Mary and Larry said people listened on tiny little boxes called transistor radios. I had one. A Panasonic, which was a new brand back then. Panasonic transistor radio. It was turquoise. And yeah, you had a mono like earbud that wasn't anything like the earbuds today. Sounded like crap. Um,
political humor songs go well live. That they do. I will totally agree with Sumoyo, <laughs> Sumio about that. Um, man, I was speaking to the North Dakota Songwriters Association many, many years ago, the very early days of Taxi. I would fly anywhere to get in front of a room full of songwriters and pitch Taxi to them. They asked if I would stick around and spend like three hours listening to every song everybody in their group of 25 people ever wrote. Nicest people in the world. And there was one guy that got up there and just killed it doing humorous political stuff back then. Hysterical. He was great. Again, I don't know who the market was for it other than maybe playing that stuff, you know, at the local Elks Club on beer and cheer night or something. I don't know. Um, now everybody takes politics so seriously and there's so much animus out there that, you know, look at it this way, uh, Larry. If if you make a song that's Republican-leaning, you, uh, you um, piss off the Democrats. If you make a song that's liberal and Democrat leaning, you're going to piss off the Republicans. So I, I don't know, just play it for your friends on beer and cheer night. <laughs> There's my not too brilliant advice on that. Um, second question from Brewster Mosley, which is a great name, by the way, a great character name in a book, Brewster Mosley. Um, does Taxi ever ask for songs of spiritual nature? My, my song is about an individual who passed away and is singing to their lover on earth, telling them not to worry that their love will not die and will reunite. All right, um, I'm guessing, sadly, that you must have lost somebody, and that's what inspired the song, so my condolences on that. Uh, very personal and really, the number of times that you're gonna see your request for something like that. This is beyond just being spiritual. It's a story, a specific story about a specific circumstance. I don't think you're ever going to see a listing. And I hate to use ever or never words, but um, if it's going to be used in film and TV, your song tells the story. What are the odds that a movie is going to have that same story um, and that they want a song that tells the story, most music supervisors would say that is too on the nose. If the song is telling the story that the story is telling on the screen, that's just like corny as can be to have them both doing yeoman's work explaining that same thing. So I, I don't think that you've got a um, good probability on that. I just don't. Let's see, did we have a second question here? Oh, we have a second one from somebody. Okay, let's see what Liz brought me in here. Um, this is from Reagan Olson. Uh, what if your first forward has happened? A couple weeks have gone by, and in the meantime, you've created a similar tune just in case the library asks for more. But then they don't get in touch with you. Is there any way to submit that additional tune through Taxi? Um, assume that the tune was... No, once the listing is closed, we can't email them or call them and say, oh, by the way, somebody we forwarded to you that you haven't reached out to yet created an additional thing that's very much in that ballpark and they would love for us to pass it along to you. Uh, honestly, it's clunky at best. And if we did it for you, we'd have to do it for every single member out of thousands of them all over the world that then would say, oh, by the way, I haven't heard yet from a library, but it created another thing that would be closely associated with that first thing they asked for. We'd spend our whole day chasing around trying to get that accommodated. So I'm sorry to say, no, nope, can't do that one. Um, this one, this question from Lisa Piquang. I am French speaking. <laughs> I apparently am not. Je parle un petit peu, but très petit. Uh, I have a French pattern of writing songs that I use for English as well. Um, I won contests, but never hooked with the library before. Um, I find that in America, to be commercial, uh, your rendition, when you are not well known, must be shorter and on point. That's true. Um, only superstars that have built a large following have the privilege of just doing whatever the hell they want and everybody's cool with it. Yeah, when you're new, 
get right to the point. How long do you think a song should be to be effective to connect with others in social media? In the French method, songs can go till four or five minutes, uh, no more. But usually in America, best is to go no more than three minutes or three minutes, 30 seconds. Do you think this is the right time or can you give me a short plan of the most common pattern, <clears throat> common pattern to follow to be accepted easily? Um, honestly, you guys would be very impressed with me that the other night, Thursday night, Wednesday night, uh, I actually sat down and listened to the top 20 most popular music songs you know, on YouTube. Um, and then listen to the next 20 as well. I uh, spent the whole night listening to music so that I could stay current. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked by how many songs I saw that were slightly over two minutes, maybe like two minutes and 18 seconds and up to two minutes and 30 seconds or 40 seconds. Uh, I would say 10 or 15 percent, maybe 20 or 30 percent of all the stuff I saw. I was like, really? That's a full song just looking at the times. Um, there is no question that because so much music is disseminated to the public on TikTok, on Instagram, maybe still some degree on Facebook, what have you, um, the attention span has certainly grown shorter, again, because we have so much stuff to look at with that little evil box in our hands. Um, we don't invest ourselves in growing, building a close relationship with a song as much as we used to back when music was more central to our lives. So my answer is three minutes and 30 seconds is pushing it now. Three minutes is probably your target. Four or five minutes, not so much. You know, it's funny, I'm gonna tell a tale out of school, but I'm not gonna mention any names, but there is a person that does uh, a bunch of YouTube videos, uh, mostly about the sync industry. Uh, puts himself out there as quite expert, although he just got his first paycheck from sync last quarter, I believe, or maybe this present quarter recently in the last month or two. Um, and, and he, didn't renew Taxi, and then he did renew Taxi and has reviewed Taxi. Uh, and now I'm not speaking about our friend Dave, um, but this other gentleman um, was like, just didn't love Taxi. Stuff wasn't getting forwarded. And when it did get forwarded, he didn't get a call back. And it's just like, um, I went and looked at his submission history after one of his videos pissed me off a little bit. And no wonder, I mean, this guy put, is putting, he's writing, he's got a book for sale, he's teaching classes, he's um, consulting for people, I think for like $75 an hour, yet one of his submissions said, you know, no more than two minutes, give or take. I'm paraphrasing that, but it was probably said, you know, submission should be 90 seconds to two minutes, give or take. He had one submission in there that was over five minutes long. And yet he, he always would preach, you know, read the brief. Um, apparently he didn't read the brief. And anybody with any knowledge of the sync industry knows it would be an extremely rare circumstance where you could pitch a five-minute song, instrumental, whatever. So a um, little inside baseball there for you on that, Lissa. Um, but yes, definitely shorter is better. Get right to the meat. Don't give a 35 second intro. Nobody's got that much patience anymore. And you're thinking it's gonna get them in the mood. It's like drinking a little wine before you sit down for fine dining. Not the same. People, it's like, blow me away right now. Hook me right now. Make me wanna sing that chorus over and over again right now. Get to it. So there you go. Instant gratification is the way of the world now. Little weird, but it's true. All right, uh, this one's from Shane Stever. When a library receives your forwards, are they more likely to start a relationship with me if I have more forwards from a single listing? Um, let's say I see several instrumental listings with deadlines in a two-week period that I feel I would do great on, and I have the bandwidth to compose four quality tracks to any of those listings. Hypothetically, in this situation, those four get forwarded. So I'm wondering if I should put all my energy into that one listing or split it up while retaining the quality 
of my submissions. Um, a couple is okay, unless some listings will say they're looking to go deep with you. They, they, more and more libraries are now trying to find people that can generate an entire album of stuff for them. Um, I personally, I, I don't think that's a terrible idea on the library's part, but I, I spend more time as an independent observer looking at library catalogs than probably anybody else on the planet. And I'm not convinced that it's all that impressive when you click over to a certain genre on a library and they've only got music from three composers in there and it sounds pretty damn the same, you know? It's like, okay, well, those 12 sound boringly the same, clearly the same composer and clearly not a bunch of fresh ideas. Uh, and then you listen to the next batch, same thing, and the next batch, same thing. Um, I would think that if they have, let's say, you know, 100 dramedy tracks, any genre, but let's just use dramedy because it's easy to think about. Uh, I, I would want, you know, three from this person, five from that person, seven from that person, two from that person, one from that person. I would want a smorgasbord of great high quality material, not more of the same dude or dude at. Um, just my personal opinion. So, I think that the library practice of doing full albums, which is usually 10, 11, 12, 13, tracks the same person, probably not the best idea. Again, that's just my opinion. They would know better because they're the ones actually counting the pennies and they know what works better than I do, maybe. Maybe certainly. Um, I would say you are best off, Shane, pitching a couple. Also, you know what? When I used to be a screener here, it was a long time ago and stuff was still coming in on like cassettes and CDs back then. I remember sometimes people would send in multiples thinking the more I send, the greater chance I have of them hearing something that gets past the screener. I saw that as somebody waving their hand going, I really don't know much about the music industry. I'm kind of a rookie. So I'm doing this rookie move to try and up my chances of getting a forward. Um, I would never ever hold back forwarding something that was forwardable, forwardable, um, because I thought that was a rookie move on their part. I, I wouldn't, you can't hold that against somebody if the music is right and should be forwarded. But it just puts a little thing back here, you know, in the back of your neck, the hair stands up and you go, rookie, rookie move. I wouldn't do that. Um, I just had somebody in the staff tell me the other day that I think it was a new member or somebody submitted for the solo piano comp CD, that we're, comp CD, comp uh, playlist thing that we're sending out to all the libraries. And, and they, I want to say that the staff member told me somebody sent in 55 submissions for that. Um, What would you think? I, can you guys answer me in the chat room? What would you think if you got 55 submissions on one thing? And now everybody's asleep in the chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, wow. I'd listen to one or two, 55, wow. They couldn't all possibly be good. Yeah, you know, um, woo, look at me. Uh, yeah, uh, 55 times $5, it's like, and then they'll go online when they don't get it for, it could be 55 not very good things as well. Could be 55 amazing ones or 55 that are pretty good. Maybe some aren't affordable, maybe some are, but you know what? And if this person doesn't make it onto that compilation, they're gonna ask for a refund from Taxi, they're gonna ask for a refund of their submission fees, which is not part of our refund policy for reasons like this. And if we say, I'm sorry, that doesn't you know, fit within our policy, they're gonna file a complaint with the Better Business Bureau and they're gonna go on every message board, every you know, form of social media they can, Taxi ripped me off. 
this is the kind of stuff we live with all the time. So, um, Liz, do me a favor, remind me. I can't remember if it was you that told me that, but I definitely uh, think we should call that member and say, I'm sorry, we're sending back 50 of those submissions. We should send back like 53 of them, honestly, um, and, and refund the money. Um, I, I, yeah, people freak me out. Um, so, Shane, submit a couple things per listing. That's what I would do. Uh, this is from Nina Gadomsky. Uh, what's the best route to getting a demo for a country music song and about how much does it cost? Looking for a male vocalist and music because I can't sing or play. New to this, so I need really good direction. Thanks. Okay, there are several ways you can go about this, Nina. There are some legitimately impressive, wonderful demo studios in Nashville. Um, I'm sure people in the chat can recommend some. Um, and if you guys, after the show ends, can drop some other suggestions in the comments, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, 515 Studios in Nashville is one that I have known for a long time. Um, there's a guy there named Chip Hardy who produces the demos. I would seriously take a bullet for that guy. He is the nicest, most honorable, incredibly talented, knows everything there is to know about Nashville, has been a high-level publisher before, has produced some big records. Just a great guy. I trust him. So 515 Studios, um, it's in, on Blue, in Blueberry Hill, which is a neighborhood in Nashville. Chet, I mean, Chip Hardy, that's your guy. Um, there are others that have great reputations as well. Um, also, you know what? Get to know your fellow members. And basically, it sounds like you've wrote a lyric and have a melody in your head. And you want somebody to work with you to turn this thing into a song and record the track. Or maybe you can play guitar and have a guitar vocal version. I don't know. There are taxi members who don't have the skills that you may have but are really good with producing stuff in their studios. And that is a good reason to collaborate. How you find a collaborator is go on the Taxi Forum at forumswithans.taxi.com and say, uh, country music top liner looking to collaborate with a track maker, track producer. Um, and you'll find somebody that rather than spending, because demos in Nashville typically range I'm going to say 450 bucks up to maybe a thousand. Um, some of our members may know uh, better than I. There's another good one, Fett at Azalea Studios. I can't believe I didn't remember him in Nashville. Longtime taxi member, close personal friend of mine. High quality work, extremely honorable. Um, sorry for not thinking of you, Fett. Out of, out of sight, out of mind. You haven't sent me any like candy or love notes or flowers or anything lately <laughs> anyway yeah he'd be a good choice um wow two thousand dollars that's a lot that's way a lot 515 under new ownership it could be um Cold Capertune, or that is a Cold Capper, uh, another one. Anyway, there, there are lots of them. But you know what? It breaks my heart when people do that. They spend $1,000 on a demo, and they didn't submit it to Taxi for um, a custom critique beforehand. They may find out, they spent the 1000 bucks and then have the screeners uniformly say the song really needs a bridge to be a contender. And you go, crap, I wish I'd thought of that before I spent a thousand bucks recording it. Now it doesn't have a bridge. Do I have to spay, uh, spell, uh, spend another thousand dollars to put a bridge in there? So my suggestion is get yourself a taxi custom critique. Um, and for 20 bucks, say, I, I'm thinking about doing a full production on this. Can you give me any advice before I spend the money on producing a demo? But again, there are taxi members that you can collaborate with where they get 50% ownership in it. 
for doing the work for free because you could spend a thousand dollars and then you submit that one thing over and over and over to a bunch of listings with it's probably not a good fit for but you're like oh man i spent a thousand bucks there's got to be something so i'm going to take a pot shot at that one a pot shot at that one a pot shot at that one and none of them work out and then you end up hating taxi because you made a lot of not so intelligent choices in the beginning so please heed my advice think twice before you spend the money, um, definitely consider getting a custom critique from Taxi. You can call anybody uh, on my staff or email member services. They'll show you how to get a custom critique. And the questions you want to ask are, before I get this song fully produced at a demo studio, do you have any advice? They may tell you that the lyrics aren't strong enough. They may tell you the song needs a bridge. They may tell you the chorus doesn't pop enough. Um, they may tell you the style is too dated. There are a lot of ways they can save your life and save your money before you spend that thousand bucks on something that you would probably regret later. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, this one's from David Bertner. Um, how do I make the most of the road rally if my goal is to license songs for jingles and use in film and TV? Um, you mean TV commercials. Jingles, you know, unless you're like, my pillow or one of the insurance companies a lot of people don't use jingles anymore um, but you mean for tv commercials film and tv so the best thing you can do is start making friends now on the taxi forum so that when you get to the road rally you've already got a posse of friends and they will be at different levels of experience and success but then you meet them at the rally and you co-mingle with the people that they know and become part of a larger circle of members, sooner or later you are going to meet um, library owners that your new friends know. Um, and hopefully the quality of what you're making is good enough that you can take advantage of those relationships. Don't prematurely just shove stuff in the face of library owners going, here, man, you got to check this out. This is great. I'm great. This is the best music you could, you'll ever hear, and it's in 20 different genres. I'm awesome. I'm going to make you a fortune. Don't do that. That is a very bad first date, okay? So I hope you find that to be good advice, but I'm telling you, hanging out in the chat room on Taxi TV um, and, and then getting to know people in the forum, build your circle of friends before you go and it will all fall into place um there's one from nelson ortiz who upload a song and submit it to a taxi listing and the listing closes then upload an updated version of the same song will the reviewer get the updated song or the original you uploaded first um hard to say because we could have one screener on it we could have three screeners on it we could have five screeners on it just don't know um i would if you when you upload the second one go in and delete the first one that would be my advice um super blonde asked a question that i want to address the because it's similar in nature and i've got a good answer for that super blonde said previously after submitting a track to a listing there was an icon on the submission page which allowed editing the audio track of the pending submission before the deadline expired to replace the audio track with a newer revision. Recently, I noticed this didn't work on a submission. There was no button to edit the audio track um, anymore. Uh, was there a change or do some listings not allow editing a submission prior to the deadline or what? Uh, really, nothing has changed, but your timing was such um, we typically start screening listings the day of the deadline. So if, if the deadline is 11.59 p.m. on May 1st, uh, on the morning of May 2nd, we start screening. In some cases, on a really big listing, something where we get three, four, five hundred tracks, which is not that often, uh, people fantasize that we get in you know, 100,000 submissions, you've got no chance of getting heard. No, I mean, could be 27 submissions, could be 118, could be 214. Uh, but for something like that piano compilation, I would be willing to bet that a lot of people, including the gentleman who submitted 55 things, um, that we will get so many that we will start screening in advance of the deadline 
because we just need to, especially when it's something that's on a deadline with a library client or a music supervisor. Um, so we may start screening the night before, the afternoon before, or two days before. That would be a stretch, typically a day before on something where we got a lot of submissions. Why I'm telling you this is when, as soon as the screeners start working on it, that locks out any revisions. Because if, it, if the database didn't treat it that way, a screener could be in the middle of screening something and Super Blonde goes, oh crap, I forgot to include that second guitar part, goes in and tries to hit the edit button and revise the submission while it's actually being listened to. That would be like throwing um, a monkey wrench into the fan belt of your car while you're doing 100 miles an hour on a downhill somewhere. Yeah, just like that. Anyway, um, Nancy, leaving now for your part-time job. Bye, y'all. Well, congrats again on the, on getting the computer, Nance. Um, I'll go five minutes long because I saw a couple in here. Uh, uh, Ronnie Bear wants to know, because uh, he, he missed the microphone episode, which I didn't talk about how to place mics on a, uh, on a Leslie, on a Hammond B3 Leslie cabinet. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because nobody mics those anymore. Not enough people, in my opinion. I loved miking Leslie cabinets. So here's what I would do. First of all, you are asking for nothing but phase issues. So definitely check um, pan, you know, your left, you're going to mic it in stereo and listen to it in stereo, but then pan everything up to the middle or hit a mono button to see if frequencies drop out like crazy because you've got um, phase issues. So it's been a long time since I've done this, but I believe that I just put two mics up, up on the top with the whirling horns and two mics on the bottom. I think it, for one thing I did, I did an album where the, it was like a Southern rock band and they had B3 and pretty much everything. And I had to worry about um, the bottom end of the B3 getting muddied up or muddying up the bass and the low end on the piano. So I didn't want to make the bottom end stereo. So what I did was I took an 87 uh, and put that pretty close to the whirling thing down on the bottom, the woofer, <laughs> if you will, on, on the B3 cabinet, and then used two stereo mics upstairs on the horns. Um, again, you're asking for all kinds of phase problems, but in the end, that worked out really well. You could also put two mics on the bottom, two mics on the top. I would say, generally speaking, put them about eight or 10 inches out from the sound source um, and try and get them all even so they're equidistant from the source so that you don't get any weird phase problems, but definitely check for phase problems. Um, Let's see, I thought I saw one more. Uh, can I do another Ask Michael anything to answer questions in the chat? Sure. Um, yeah, we got an inordinate number of questions that required fairly long answers today um, in the emails. And, and as promised, those usually take precedent. Um, Do you reveal your secrets why our mixes do or do not sound like hit records? That's a half hour right there. Um, but I will tell you, the first best step is to buy a plugin that's got the SSL um, program mixer, the, you know, the, the buck, the bus compression, whatever you call it. I can't remember, I have one on my console now. I can't remember what the hell it's called, but yeah. Um, bus compression, um, not a lot. The SSL compressor sounded really good on, you know, like what I called back then, the two mix out of the mix bus. Um, it just made everything sound better. It adds what they nowadays call glue. I don't think we called it glue back in my day. Um, 
that's the best advice I can give you is like a three to one ratio and set the threshold. So it, well, actually it's auto set uh, on the SSL. Um, it's got like a more or less knob, I think. Anyway, I, I've got a, um, I want to say a Waves version of it for like 30, 35 bucks. Sounds really good. And put that on stuff, it automatically will sound better and a little bit more like you're used to hearing records. And with that, today's show is over. Okay, you know what? Next time I do one of these, I will do only questions that we get in the chat. How's that? Um, and I had a note to tell you guys something. Where's that note? There it is. Okay, first of all, if you've never watched a Taxi TV before, please hit the subscribe button um, so that you can be aware of more of these when we do them. Um, and we have a, an incredible library of easily 500 of these shows and little segments of these shows that we've been amassing over many, many years. People say it's really good information, so I like them when they say that. Appreciate the compliment. Um, and also, give us a like so that YouTube will tell more people about us. Also, next week's show, we are going to do, where is it? As my special guests on the show, we're gonna have Tracy and Vance Marino join me, the authors of Hey, That's My Song. Check it out if you haven't already or if you don't own it. And the topic of next week's show is going to be five ways to ruin an industry relationship. Five ways to ruin an industry relationship. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Ask Michael Anything. See you next Monday right here at 4 o'clock Pacific time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys.